course, you get to see the back of my head, the better part of me. Well, it's good to see you. We're here to worship God, to share together in Christian fellowship, and to just enjoy being in God's house. Amen? All right. Just a couple of items we need to make you aware of. First and foremost, we want to remind you about our youth selling T-shirts. Remember the object of the game, this is a fundraiser. So if you don't like the t-shirt, just give them $20 anyway. God will bless you and uh, and they'll be a blessing to you. Our youth are trying hard and doing hard and doing better. Miss Tara Cobb is just doing an excellent job as our youth director. All right, when you hear the chime, we prepare our hearts for worship.
sing all stanzas. We stand together as we sing. <laughs> faith together using the ancient creed of the church we say I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this is who come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. If you are a guest with us this morning, we're glad that you're here and we welcome you here. If you were uh, tuning in on our live stream, we are thankful that you are here for that as well. Uh, before we bow our heads for a moment of prayer, I would like to ask you please to remember Chester Norris. Uh, Chester has been transferred from uh, D DCH here to UAB which is a good thing, so please pray for them as they move forward in the uh, next few weeks. And also, please remember, continue to remember Bing Blewett. Uh, pray that he can, they can get him off the ventilator and then go forward with that. So let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our gracious and loving God, we are grateful for this opportunity we have to gather together and worship. And today as we gather, as and all this day, we celebrate our mothers. So Lord, we thank you for the gift of life that they are to us, for the gift of love and of grace and of mercy. And Lord, what a gift it is that you have given us that is there to walk with us, to strengthen us, and to show us how to live life. But Lord, we also thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus who transformed our hearts and transforms our lives. Lord, challenge us each and every day to walk closer to him, 
to allow him to guide us, to direct us, and to show us how we should speak, how we should act, and how we should live. But also we ask you to forgive us for our sins, for the times that we fall short of your glory. And Lord, as we confess those here this morning, I pray that each of us will hear you say to us, my child, you are forgiven. Allow that forgiveness to soak in to, through our ears to our hearts and to transform our hearts so that we not only accept the forgiveness, but we offer that same measure of forgiveness to our brothers and sisters. Pour your Holy Spirit out upon us. Draw us closer to you, closer to each other. And Lord, send us out into the world so that we can share the wonders, the marvelous things that you are doing in our lives. We pray for those who are sick, for those we have called, for those we list on our prayer list, and for those we name in our hearts. For those that need healing, we pray for your healing touch. For those that need guidance, we pray that you will guide them. For those that need strength, we pray that you will lift them up. And for those who have lost their way, we pray that you will be their guiding light that will bring them home, home to your presence. And as always, we pray for the leaders of our country, for the leaders of our state, for the leaders of our community, and for the leaders of this church. Lord, we pray this and we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. and claim
name it, child, you're standing on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground, and I know it This morning, take your hymnals again. We turn to hymn number 84. Now, thank we all our God. We stand together as we sing stanza one. Now, thank we all our God with heart and hands and Gracious and loving God, we give back to you. These are our tithes and our gifts and our offerings and ourselves to your service, your kingdom upon the face of this earth. In Christ we pray. Amen.
to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, uh, grandmothers, great-grandmothers. Um, this song that when I realized I was singing on Mother's Day, this song um, was, I think the words are just perfect um, because I can't think of anyone that's more a prayer warrior than a mother. And so um, I hope you enjoy the, the words um, after two specials and a, a solo earlier. I'm not sure the notes are going to come out, but the words will be there. You may see her in the grocery with her children Or in the city nine to five each working day She's a mother or a teacher or a woman all alone But she's someone else entirely when she prays She's a prayer warrior Down on her knees Wrestling with powers And principalities Standing in the gap for others For her sisters and her brothers Reaching heaven with her heart Prayer warrior We don't see her lonely nights of intercession Or that tear she sheds with every whispered prayer we may not see the secret things hidden in her heart, but the eyes of God are watching her with care. She's a prayer warrior down on her knees, wrestling with powers and principalities standing in the gap for others for her sisters and her brothers reaching heaven with her heart and we'll never fully know the debt we owe her for we'll never know the evil we've been spared The many nights she's crashed through Satan's strongholds Reaching heaven with her prayers She's a prayer warrior down on her knees wrestling with powers and principalities standing in the gap for others for her sisters and her brothers reaching heaven with her heart oh you have touched the very heart of God Prayer warrior Prayer warrior Prayer warrior Thank you, all you prayer warriors. Thank you, Denise. Thanks again. Oh, 
I, I told them in the 830 service, so about 28 years ago, I learned a valuable lesson. You know, it was my second year in the church, and it was Mother's Day, and I thought, well, I can just do the lectionary and mention mothers before the sermon, and sermon doesn't have to be about mothers. Well, that's what I did. After the service, my choir director, who walked up to me, and she said, listen, preacher, uh, you're about my children's age, so I can go ahead and tell you this. Don't ever preach on Mother's Day again and not have the sermon about mothers. You know how I responded, don't you? Yes, ma'am. And uh, so uh, for 28 years, I followed that advice, and we have been. So today we are here to celebrate our, our mothers and give thanks for the blessings that they are to each of us. I mean, mothers are that living example of love, grace, and mercy in our lives. They are special people who God put in our lives to be a blessing. So mothers today... We thank God for you, and we bless you, and hopefully we bless you daily. Do you know, it's funny to me that moms, even though sometimes they seem superhuman, it's amazing they all speak the same language. And I don't know, I don't think it's written down or, or it's not taught as a college class. Maybe there was. Uh, uh, but, you know, mothers seem to have this same dialect they use. And perhaps you've heard these words. Don't get smart with me. How many of you ever want to look at her and say, well, do you want me to get dumb? Or just this one. Don't wait. I, I, just wait till your dad gets home. I love this one. If you break a leg, don't come running to me. You are going to have fun. Where's my change? That's the last time I'm going to tell you. Of course, my favorite, and I would say that about 50-50 on this one I am, is my mother, even to this day, when we leave her, will say, when you get home, make sure you text and let me know you're there. You know, few things are more powerful than the tears and the prayers of a mother. A mother's hug or, or compassionate touch can, can instantly make things better. You know, I read this uh, week that, that there are 69 kings in the history of France. Only three of those were truly loved by their subjects. You know what set those three apart? Those three were the only three that were raised by their mothers not by a tutor or a guardian. Napoleon actually said, and I think this is true, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. But I want us to ask a question this morning. If you, if you could choose a mother for your children, what characteristics would you look for? Would she be wealthy? Would she have a nice place to live? Would she be famous or, or well-educated or mature or experienced? Now, I'm sure we all have, a, you know, an opinion on this matter, but today, being Mother's Day, I want us to go to the source, and I want us to see how God answered those above questions, and, and we're going to do it by looking at the characteristics of the mother God chose to raise his son Jesus. Now, I will warn you, the answer is not specifically laid out in Scripture or directly answered. But, but I think in our text this morning, it kind of lays a pattern for us so we can understand the characteristics. So if you have your Bibles, if you will open them up to the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, we'll be reading verses 28 through 38. If not, you can follow along on the screen that is there before you. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words, pondering what sort of greetings this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy and he will be called son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren for nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God for the thanks be to God. And actually it was for the people of God, but... uh, you know, uh, I've I put your outline in the bulletin so you don't have to hold two pieces of paper today. But, uh, you know, I want us to look at God chose Mary because of what she already had and, and because of who God knew Mary could become. You know, Mary was highly favored by God because Mary had a proper perspective. You know, when Gabriel came and tapped Mary on the shoulder and began to speak, Mary was obviously greatly troubled by the message that Gabriel brought. Why? Well, you've got to understand, Mary's day, she was already engaged to Joseph. So in that engagement, basically, they were almost married, you could say. As a matter of fact, it it took a bill of divorce before the engagement could be broken. And, And so Mary being pregnant would be seen as Mary being unfaithful to her husband. And in her day, that meant Mary could be stoned to death for that very act. I mean, it was so serious that when a couple was engaged, that even if they had a child before they were married and the husband died, that child would become legitimate because their marriage was seen as binding before the actual wedding ceremony. So in other words, to say that Mary's pregnancy was unique is one thing. But the truth of it is, it would be awful hard to explain. Not to mention the fact that, hey, Mary, we we know is a teenager. So can you imagine? She must have felt insecure, unprepared, or unworthy for having a child, let alone for having a child that was the son of God. You know, and Mary could have come up with some excuses. I mean, you probably have heard this story and you've thought of them for her. Lord, why me? Why am I favored? God, I'm just a teenager. I, I'm not married yet. It's not official. I, I'm not prepared for this experience. I, are you sure, God, there's not somebody else? Did you get the wrong number? But instead, what I want you to hear in verse 38, the beginning of it, How did Mary respond? Here I am, the servant of the Lord. See, that shows us that right perspective that Mary had. Mary knew who God was. She knew that as a servant of God, nothing was impossible with God. Now, I want you to hear those words again. When Gabriel came to her, he did not say that nothing was impossible for God because Mary had no doubt of that. He said that nothing is impossible with God. Do you hear the difference here? For Mary, it's a crisis of faith. She believed that God could do anything, but she had questions when it came to God working through a young, inexperienced teenage girl, making her the mother of his son. 
But the only way for Mary to understand was by being able to see it through the right perspective. And that was through the eyes of faith. And Mary opened up her life and her heart to God. She knew that God was not calling her to be perfect, but she knew that God was calling her to surrender. A surrendered life it is a life that's basically just placed in the hands of God. It's realizing that nothing is impossible with God. A surrendered life says, God, I, I know that you can do this through me. Now take me, lead me, and use me for your glory. But what I want you to hear is this doesn't happen in, in an instance. Mary did not take one giant step and say, Lord, here it is. I'm done. I'm surrendered. It's over. I, I think it was a bunch of baby steps over the year where Mary took the first step here by saying, here I am stepping into God's hands knowing that God could lead her until she got to the next situation where she had to say, here I am again, Lord, and he had to take over and, and lead her again. That's what it means to be a servant of God. It is stepping continually, baby step after baby step into the hands of God and trusting that nothing is impossible with God. But Mary also had a solid foundation. I meant to tell them that you must have cheated and looked at my outline this week because when I heard the, uh, the prelude, I thought, whew, she's giving my point. The second point here is Mary also had a solid foundation. You may say, what are you talking about? Listen to the rest of verse 38. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. And then Mary says, let it be with me according to your word. See, Mary's foundation was God. And, and it was his word. Mary was grounded in the word of God. Now, I know you're thinking, well, now, preacher, you're stretching this to get all that just from that little phrase. But turn over to Luke 2, and, and you read where Luke records Mary's song. You know, in those 10 verses, it's evident that Mary knew scripture. Because in those 10 verses, there are at least 30 references or phrases or words that echo the truth of the Old Testament. Mary knew God's word and she was willing to take it even a step further by putting it into action. Mary not only knew God's word, but then she sang God's praises in the middle of this moment. Her solid foundation is an example to all of us sitting here in this room. Whether you're a mother or a father or, or a parent or just anybody here, it's important for all of us as, as mothers, fathers, aunts, and uncles to build our life on a strong foundation in God's word so that we can sing God's praises into the lives of our children or into the lives of our grandchildren or into the lives of those that we come in contact with. And you know, folks, it's, it's easy. It's just doing little things. It's my mother on rainy days during the summer when she probably was just trying to save her house because of three unruly boys inside the house gathering us around the table and reading us stories from the Old Testament. Stories of Moses, stories of King David. It, it, it's us taking those stories and it's us passing those stories on to our children and our grandchildren. It, it's letting your children, let, let them see you sitting at the table with your Bible open, studying God's Word. And you know what? It's okay if you don't have the answers for all the questions because I've heard that so many times. Look at them if you don't have the answer and say, hey, let's find it together. And then search the Bible, God's word, for that. It is showing up for worship and making it a priority in your life and in the life of your family. It is building your home, life, and family on a solid foundation, one brick at a time, 
2,023 years ago, God chose a teenager, a young girl, to give birth to his son, Jesus. He chose her because of what she already had. That proper perspective, that solid foundation, and it's something that all godly mothers, all of us need today. But God also chose Mary because of who Mary would become. You know, Mary was unrelenting in her protection. But you know, that's natural. And motherhood and protection kind of seem to go hand in hand. I mean, mothers kind of seem to have that built-in instinct to protect their young. You know, from the very moment that Jesus was born, Guess what? Mary and Joseph received news that Herod's about to kill all the children under the age of two. So they pack up in the middle of the night and they leave behind everything they know and they move to Egypt so they can protect their baby. But you know, Mary not only physically protected Jesus, but she protected his identity. Listen to what Luke tells us in Luke 2, 19. But Mary treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. You know, it's interesting to me. You may want to underline that word treasured. That word treasured in Greek means an intense, protective keeping. You know, Mary Mary hid what she knew about Jesus in her heart. She, She protected it. You know... She knew that if she let spilt the beans and told everybody what Jesus was going to do, she would place him in danger long before God's appointed time for ministry. And, and Mary recognized it. So she treasured it. She kept that gift, the gift that, of what Jesus would do, protected in her, arm, in her heart. Mary's unrelented protection. Mothers, how many of you protect your children unrelentingly you know it's natural I watched it yesterday with my my little nephew who's three every time he would leave the room his mother would want to know where he was going because you know you know mothers just kind of know there's risk out there like light sockets and kids like to put their finger in them or or stairs or or germs or poison or or stoves or you know three-year-olds can find anything to get in trouble with and, and if you don't think, believe me about protective nature of a mother, when you leave this service, go down the hall and ask Melanie. Just ask her this one simple question. Melanie, what happens when you send a letter home that says, your child was bitten today, or your child was scratched today, or your child was knocked down today? Ask her how the mother responds to those letters You want to get a mother riled up, you do something to their child. But what we need to hear is this unrelenting protection doesn't stop when they get older. Sure, it gets better when they get a little bit older. They they may not be in danger of sticking their finger in the light socket, but they still need your protection and your guidance. Folks, your children, your grandchildren are facing stuff in this world today that we never even dreamed of when we were kids. What they need is they need to know that in this moment, you are there to give them protection and guidance. When it comes to drugs, when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to peer pressure, when it comes to sexual questions, sexual immorality, all these things that teens face, the point is you cannot quit parenting your children. Even when your children don't want you to protect them anymore, you need to remember you are the parent. They don't need another friend. Now, I'm not saying that you can watch them every second. Your kids don't need a helicopter that's flying over them in the form of a parent watching every move. What they need is a parent that is willing to be there for them to speak the truth in love to them, to hold them accountable, 
to listen to them, even to the hard stuff, they also need to know that no matter what happens, you will still love them and you will still walk with them in those moments. God looked with favor upon Mary because he knew she had unrelenting, was unrelenting in her protection. And because he knew that what she could do, what she would be, that she was unwavering in her love and devotion. You know, the truth of it is Mary's love for Jesus never wavered or, or never diminished. You know, the first picture we get of Mary is what? What I just read to you. Teenage girl scared to death. Gabriel's come to visit her in the middle of the night and give her this great news that she's favored by God. And, and we, we watch that moment. The, the next picture of Mary we get is, is, is Mary's a little bit older probably a little gray-headed. Her skin is, is, is darker than it was. It's wrinkled by the sun from Judean uh, years living in Judea. Her eyes show the wear of years of struggle. But do you know when's the last time we see Mary in Scripture? It's not at the cross. Now, she was there. She was standing by at the cross when, when Jesus was hanging there. We know that because Jesus looked down, remember, from the cross. And he said to John and to Mary, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your, your mother. But you know, the last glimpse we get of Mary is not in the Gospels. It's actually in the book of Acts. In Acts 1.14, we see they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. 30 plus years later, Mary is still where she was in the very beginning, standing with Jesus. Mary's love and devotion is unquestionable. Now, I know you're thinking, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. It's Jesus. You know, how could she not love him? It was easy to love Jesus. And you know what? I agree. It, it was easy to love Jesus. But I want you to hear this. Loving Jesus was not an easy road for Mary. I mean, think about it. It had to be difficult. Remember what the old prophet Simon told her when she presented him at the temple in the month old? This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of, of many in Israel. And then he looks Mary in the eyes and said, a sword will pierce your own soul. Think of how many times Mary's soul must have been pierced. Not only the time that they had to flee in the middle of the night to Egypt. What about when he was 12? Mary and Joseph were on the way home. After three days, she realizes Jesus is not with the, pe the crowd. He's not there. I mean, what would it be like? You've, you've all experienced it. You've turned around. Your child wasn't where they were supposed to be. You know, you know how you panic losing your child? Now, imagine losing the Son of God. And, and I mean, you know, she can't find him. She runs everywhere. They've looked everywhere. And then when they find Jesus, he's in the temple. And, and, and Jesus just looks at her. He's so compassionate. He looks at her and says, Mother, I must be about my father's business. You don't think that pierced her soul? What about John 7? When we hear that his own brothers and sisters have rejected Jesus, they don't want anything to do with him. They don't believe a word he is saying. Can you imagine what it was like when they had a family gathering and all sat down at the table Mary's soul had to be pierced. Not to mention every time she went to the synagogue or every time she saw a lamb that was brought for sacrifice. Imagine how Mary must have felt when the, they, they stood up and read Isaiah 53 or, or some of the other prophecies about his death. And then let's just think about Good Friday. 
as Mary stood and watched the nails being driven into the hands and feet that she once kissed and held so close as a baby. And she watched as they stripped him, they beat him, they mocked him. Mary's soul was pierced. You know what? It was easy to love Jesus, but loving Jesus was not easy. Yet Mary's love and devotion was unwavering from conception to the cross and beyond. When others mistreated Jesus, Mary was there. When others turned away and ran, Mary was there. Even at the cross, when all of his friends were gone, Mary was standing there with him. The disciples may have fled, but not his mother. Mary was still there. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I remember when I felt the call in the ministry, I went and talked to my parents about that and uh, informed them that I was going to follow God's call and I was going to quit my job and Chris and I were moving and I was going back to school. My dad looked across the table at me and said, you have lost your mind. <laughs> There's times I've thought that, yeah, I've, I, you know, but he said, you got a job, you got a four-year-old, what, what are you doing? And my dad wasn't the only one that reacted that way of my friends that I told. And there was another lady that was in the room. It was my mom. She didn't sit down at the table at that time. She was usually wandering around the kitchen doing something. My mother, I'm sure she questioned, but my mother just kind of looked across the table and said, okay. And it was kind of like, I knew then it was going to be okay. You know, it's, I, I absolutely, and I bet some, uh, most of you feel this way. There is absolutely nothing that I could do that would make my mother stop loving me. And as a parent of children, I can tell you there is absolutely nothing that my children could do that would make me stop loving them. I may want to kill them, but it would not make me stop loving them. You know, it's that love and devotion that we celebrate. George Eliot once said, we often do the impossible not because we think we can, but because someone who, res who we respect knows we can, and that someone is our mother. So today... And we really should do it every day. But today is your special day. So today we give thanks for our mothers. For always being there for us. And what I want to do is all the ladies here that are mothers. And if you're not a, a, a biological mother, guess what? You are a mother to some others. But if all the ladies would stand for just a minute, if you're able, if you're not able, stay where you are. If you'll stand, ladies, I want to say a blessing for you. You are highly favored by God. God favors you because of who you are. You are a tremendous gift to your children, to your families, to your, this church family, and to your friends. You always seem to have the right perspective and have placed us on a solid foundation. And it is the foundation that you live out before us that gives us the confidence to move forward knowing and believing with all of our heart that nothing is impossible with God. And just as God has made you special, you have made us special as well. You have protected us from the beginning. You have always been in our corner. You were there always. Even when we were hard to love, you believed in us when no one else did. You might not be perfect, but in our eyes, you are perfect. A perfect expression of love, of grace, and of mercy. So today, 
we pray for God's blessings on you. That you remember how special you are. That you are a great gift of God. And I pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. As Ronnie comes and leads us in our closing hymn, I will remind you this altar is open to come forward and have a word of prayer. The doors of this church are open if you'd like to unite with this church. And then also, so Rita doesn't come out of somewhere and hit me in the head, we have a gift for you, lady, for the ladies. If you are from five to 105, when you go out the door, there are flowers at the back door, carnations. Pick up a carnation and take it with you. And that's part of the reminder of what a blessing you are to all of us. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.